In 2010, I was laid off from a teaching job, ending a career that I had trained for, but only just begun. I was crushed. But I put all of my energy into maintaining my composure because I thought that vulnerability meant weakness, that there was a certain shame in it. So you can imagine my surprise when I walked into the back room of a bar one evening and heard storytellers tell their true, st their true stories, and they were just regular people. Standing up in front of strangers, I couldn't believe it. They were telling everything from getting a bad haircut to going through a messy divorce to stealing money from a bank teller job. You mean we can just write it down? tell everyone at a bar, and then everyone claps. <laughs> so I booked my schedule with as many storytelling events as I could find. And I took in the stories of as many Chicagoans who would tell me. Soon people began to ask me when I was going to get up and tell a story. And I declined initially because I didn't think that I was interesting enough. However, I found it wasn't so much about having the most fascinating or dramatic life, but more about being willing to share the life that you do have. My first story was about quitting a cat. Yes, you can do that. <laughs> then I built up to the more difficult things. I struggled with some of my most difficult tales about teaching in Chicago public schools. And the more difficult it was to tell, the better I felt. Like, hey, shame, did you have something to say? Because I already said it to everyone on a microphone. <laughs> shame has no place to hide if you're the one pulling back the curtain. Inspired, I began to build a large network of people who felt the same way as I did about storytelling. I found people of all ages and all professions, teachers and lawyers and flight attendants, who shared my enthusiasm for bringing stories to the stage. And right now I'd like to take a moment and introduce three courageous storytellers to you who are going to share a piece of their lives. Then, I was the head of food and beverage at a luxury level of hotel in downtown Chicago. Had a wife who adored me. Two beautiful children. A long list of friends and family. Had traveled the world and had a beautiful condo in a great neighborhood of a world-class city. And now, what I had was a letter from unemployment that said, forget it. You did this to yourself. I had a new reputation in my professional community. I had a rapidly shrinking list of friends and family. Uh, I was losing that condo, and I had a wife who was leaving and taking the children. The height of my drinking was about a half a bottle of vodka every morning before work until I was caught with a blood alcohol level of four times the legal limit. So, sobriety. And months in, I couldn't get a job interview to save my life until a friend of a friend, Mary, reached out and said, hey, my company is launching a new line of food products and we need some help at a two-day conference. I'll pay you 200 bucks. What do you think? What I thought was 200 bucks would keep the electricity and the heat on. I didn't ask a single question. So I meet Mary in the lobby of a rundown airport hotel. She's carrying a large uh, garbage bag. And she explains to me that this is a very senior group of executives who are coming in 
to launch a new line of chicken-based products. And in order to lift their moods, Mary needs me to walk around the conference center dressed in the chicken costume she has in her large garbage bag. The chicken costume is awkwardly sized and uncomfortable. The, the top portion covered me from neck to about mid-thigh and is made of synthetic feathers. Uh, my legs are wrapped in yellow and orange striped tights, and the face of the chicken costume is severe, and its eyes are fixed. It looks like it's already been slaughtered. I dress, and Mary leads me into a conference center of executives who are munching down on their chicken-based line. They see me. They would have been my peers. They're not laughing, and they just would like for the corporate team-building bullshit segment to be over with. <laughs> and I'm standing there, timidly flapping my elbows. And then it dawns on me. I am not about to be humiliated. I'm not about to be embarrassed. I am not about to fail. I have failed. And the only thing left to do now is to make the crashing and the burning as spectacular as is possible. <laughs> I would be a chicken. I tell Mary to pretend to hold me back. She does. And at the top of my lungs, I feign chicken horror. Oh, my God, you people are eating my cousins. That's my cousin Donnie you're eating. Oh, Donnie. Mary panics. Uh, and she tries to grab me to pull me back, but my arms are flailing so wildly that she misses and grabs me by the neck, and this is a no-brainer. Hey, you guys see this? This one's trying to choke the chicken. <laughs> they love masturbation jokes, huh? <laughs> they didn't get it. But it doesn't matter. Mary tells me that she's somehow pleased with how the day went and that I am free to go. I tell her that I will definitely see her tomorrow for day two. And with no place else I was expected to be, I head home in the mid-afternoon on a frigid January Tuesday, unlocked the door to the condo I was about to lose, and told the wife who was leaving and taking the kids that it had been, finally, a very good day. So, a few years ago, my boyfriend and I decided to enter one of those citywide scavenger hunts. You know, the thing where you travel around the city and complete different obstacles. Well, this particular one was on bikes. So, the night before, I'm running around our apartment like a crazy person, trying to get all my stuff ready for the next day, grab my bag, I'm packing my bag, reading over my checklist, and he says to me, uh, babe, I'm a little worried about tomorrow. Is it even safe for us to do this? Like, maybe we shouldn't do it. And I'm only half listening because I'm very concerned about making sure that I don't forget anything. So I respond, okay, so you're feeling nervous? I mean, I think it'll be okay. They've done a million of these events. It must be safe enough. And he's like, you have to pay attention when you're on the bike. You can't let your mind go wandering off. We'll be on bikes in the city. This caught my attention. I stopped, looked up, and said, what in the world are you talking about? And out it tumbled. 
I'm so afraid you're going to get hit by a car tomorrow. Seriously, I can just see it. You're looking all around, wondering what that tree is over there, wondering who lives in the house over here, not paying any attention to the road, which is full of cars. I thought two things in this moment. One, huh, I didn't realize I spent so much time imagining. And two, he really thinks I'm going to die tomorrow. So I reassured him I would pay attention, and the scavenger hunt went off without a hitch. Minus the part where he went over the handlebars because he wasn't paying attention. <laughs> but two weeks later, he was gone. He died from cardiac arrest while running. The timing of these events, it gnaws at me. I lost so much that day. I lost him. I lost us. I lost my ability to mentally drift. For a while, I couldn't read. I couldn't nap. I certainly couldn't imagine. I never drifted off. I never zoned out. And I never forgot why I went into a room. These tricks of the mind, they are precious. After about a year, I sunk deeply into the reading of a memoir. I dozed off on a couch at my mom's house in the middle of the day. I noticed the, sweet, the trees swaying rather than searching the sidewalk for an answer. You know that you're getting better when your gaze returns upwards. And recently, just recently, I spent an entire bike ride making up the life story of a doorman that I pass regularly. It's going to be great, everyone assured me when I moved to Chicago after ending a long-term relationship. I had two things I thought would guarantee that I could start a perfect new life. Money to spend and time to enjoy it. I moved to a fancy apartment downtown. I went to restaurant openings. I walked to concerts in the park. I took writing classes and I began to perform my written work on stage. How is everything going? Your life just seems so great, everyone said. Yep, that all was pretty great. But I didn't tell them that I was lonely, as it's hard to find a new circle as an adult. People aren't generally holding auditions for new friends. I didn't tell them that I was tired of eating and seeing music and being in my fancy apartment all by myself, all the time. I began talking to strangers online, on Facebook, instant messaging texting on my phone. I poured my soul out to anyone who would listen. The more I poured, the emptier I felt. I finally had to admit out loud things were not great when I found myself drinking wine at noon in a sweaty bathrobe. I'd been holed up in my apartment for almost a month. I wrote about that month, and it helped. I told my friends about that month, and I felt better. Chicago is treating you so well, things just seem so great, everyone said when I started getting out again. Yep, I was feeling better. I was writing and performing all the time, and I managed to build a family of friends. Everything was going great. Until a friend passed away unexpectedly, and I had a familiar feeling wash over me. A discordant noise in my head. A rusty taste in my mouth a filmy haze polluting my vision. It's only temporary, I told myself. This time I had a reason to be depressed. It would pass. For weeks, I couldn't shake it. Then months. People began asking, is everything okay? You just look so tired. 
I didn't tell them that I alternated between sleeping 11 hours just to wake up exhausted and staying up all night worrying that my feelings of hopelessness would never come to an end. Nope, I'm okay, I told everyone. I barely wrote at all when I was depressed as I had a limited ability to concentrate. But I listened to other people's stories, and I reread my account of that month that I spent in my fancy apartment in my disgusting bathrobe. I had to admit that I was handling depression better this time. Even though every step that I took was an ordeal and I required a silent pep talk to get through even the most basic of tasks, this time I was out and about, practicing being alive. I limped my way through the darkness for over a year. When I talked about it honestly, I felt some light. People who suffer from depression often cycle in and out of it, so it's likely I will walk down that rough road again. Now when people ask me how I am, I tell them that I am fortunate. I am blessed to have these words to remind me that my dark days are temporary. I am confident because telling and hearing stories reinforces my belief that our joys and our sorrows are meant to be shared, and our struggles should never be meaningless. And I am grateful there are people like you who make the time to listen. So I found that the process of crafting a true story could be an artistically and emotionally uncomfortable one. I invited storytellers like these over to my living room to work on their stories in progress. I created a supportive environment and directed sensitive feedback that would help the storytellers not just get to the polished product, but arrive at a revelation. We've been meeting in living rooms all over the city for years now. It's an incubator for stories and storytelling events. Many of the producers, like, or many of the people in the group, like myself, produce shows, multiplying the impact of our collaboration many times over. Living among stories, I found my true vocation, producing and facilitating the personal narrative, the triumph of truth over silence, confidence over shame. Along the way, I found my own voice and the courage to tell my stories. Storytellers are my community and the art of storytelling, my salvation. Our minds are full of stories. When we get home from work, we tell a story about our day. When we go on dates and job interviews, we tell stories that matter to us. I no longer ask if you have a story. I ask, what is your story? Today, film, television, and social media have created a lot of distance between storytellers and audience. Storytelling and the people who dedicate their lives to it create a space for us to gather, listen, share, and connect. That is why it's so important. So tell your beautiful, brave, messy truth, because we're listening.